Hey everybody. So we're going to be looking at chapter 21 today. Foundations of Empire, um, pretty much America's imperialism across the globe. Um, it's interesting, there were ideas of this years earlier. You go all the way back to the Civil War and Secretary of State William Seward said we should expand America's influence around the world. Uh, he was laughed at the time. I mean, you got to consider time of the Civil War, America was still a relatively new country. We'd been around less than a century. And the idea of spreading our influence around the world was not many people took him seriously. 30 years later, yep. Uh, the government has set its sights abroad to really spread out our power and influence around the world. Now, the 1890s were sort of the perfect time. Um, because the 1890s was depression. We just talked about that. There was a lot of depression, 1890s, lots of concerns about the economy. Well, one of the ways you make the economy better is you expand markets. You get more customers, you get uh, more raw materials across the world. It does wonders for an economy. So, sort of with the whole depression going on, there was a lot of revived calls for uh, imperialism and finding markets for our goods. So, yeah. Uh, expansion would certainly create prosperity at home and keep, create jobs, create jobs. And this chapter will also talk about World War I. We'll cover that as well. All right. So from expansion, imperialism, foundations of empire. We'll start with Josiah Strong here. Josiah Strong, uh, he wrote Our Country, the actual full title there is Our Country, It's Possible Future in Its Present Crisis. Um, so he wrote this, he was a congregational minister. He wrote this in 85. He encouraged Protestants to spread Christianity around the world. Uh, this is what we would consider an accept, a uh, example of American exceptionalism. Uh, the reason we wanna spread Christianity around the world, Protestant Christianity, is because it's the exceptional Christianity. It's the Christianity that's more important than others, according to Josiah Strong, and also our culture usually goes with it. American the idea of American Christianity and our, our American culture are very, very blended. So you spread one, you spread the other. Uh, this is American exceptionalism. This is also this is also really racial imperialism, because part of this, uh, if you read the book and it's not that long, you could look it up on the Internet. There's a lot of frankly, it's racist, uh, lots of racist stuff. It really talks about our white racial destiny of America and Protestant Christianity. Uh, and we have to exert our authority upon all the color people of the world, um, the heathens, the uncivilized, the uneducated, the unchristian. Yeah, you kind of get the way it's going. Um, pure D white racism, white uh, supremacy ideas uh, blended with uh, Christianity. <sighs> This ideology that the U.S., America's, the white Anglo-Saxon race had a unique destiny. Our destiny was to foster democracy and uh, civilization throughout the world. Only our version of democracy, our version of civil civilization, uh, our version of Christianity. Ours was superior to all others. Because what this has implications in it, even though it doesn't come out and say it, is we're superior, we're exceptional every way. And the implication there is everyone else is inferior. If we are the top of the mountain, without saying it, you are saying everybody else is below us. And that's what it amounts to. Um, this idea that we are going to, and a lot of this goes in with social Darwinism. It ties right into social Darwinism. Uh, it, 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 we must understand this is re linked to racial theories of white su white superiority over people of color. I mean, there's actually science. It's all pseudoscience. It's not real. But there's all kinds of science and people writing books about this stuff, about how white people have bigger skulls, white people are more intelligent, white people do better in school, and in every way, white is simply superior to everything else. Um, this ties perfectly into the social Darwinism theories, racial theories, and that we are in this race war uh, to dominate the rest of the world. You, you know, it'd be nice to think the stuff was over with, that this was crap from 100 years ago. We don't have to ever worry about it again. In recent years, this has r risen up again, this idea of this white racial destiny. It's a thing again. 
what what the hell you know why, why I mean I don't I don't even understand uh, it's, it's tough to understand anyway Alfred T Mahan influence of sea power upon history he wrote this in 1890 he was a uh, he was a Navy officer he argued that naval power was essential to empire building basically we must use our Navy uh, to build an empire around the world. Obviously, we're in North America, so we have to sail everywhere we're going to go. Uh, he says Congress, uh, or well, he asked the American government to, to start building ships. And he argues that, uh, as the title implies, that history was heavily influenced by naval power, and he was. The last couple of centuries, all the most powerful countries in the world had large navies. Spain, France, England, Portugal. They had big navies, which is how they used to exert their authority over other continents and other places. And he argues the U.S. needs the same thing. We need a big navy to exert our authority upon others. Uh, he has a proposal to build ships, and Congress agrees to it. Congress agrees to start building some uh, metal battleships. Uh, steel, actually. Start building steel battleships. When we build our steel battleships, we're the only ones in the world. Most navies in the world are still using wood. They're not even using iron. A lot of places didn't use iron. Iron is just really heavy. You can't really build like a whole iron ship. It's simply, it, it like sinks, I guess. Uh, it's simply too heavy uh, to build a big iron ship. So yeah, we built steel. Steel is much lighter. Yeah, and we can make it much thinner and it's durable. We do it. We start building ships and Congress approves to build a handful of battleships. Richard Olney, Secretary of State, he goes even further just a couple years later, uh, later in the 90s. Um, and he warns England, and generally he warns everybody, to stay out of America. And by America, I don't mean the U.S. I mean the Americas, North America, Central and South. He basically warns the rest of the world, specifically Europe, they're the ones that are most concerned about, to stay out of the Western Hemisphere. We'll use our new naval tools to defend ourselves and protect our authority in the Western Hemisphere, and we'll protect all of our interests. This was about national security. Only it wasn't about national security of the U.S. We were claiming national security meant we had to protect the entire Western half of the globe. That all, any, any boy, any, anywhere where anyone could come close to America, we had to protect ourselves and defend ourselves. Uh, this half of the world is under U.S. authority. That's what we proclaimed. Interesting. What about the other 50 countries? Um, none of them were consulted in this. None of them were involved. Uh, almost every European country had a claim to some part of the Americas. So I don't know that this really meant anything to Europeans. They recognized America was an, a rising power, but I don't know if they were like nervous or anything or cared about it, frankly. Uh, to really directly interfere in someone else's econ economics or naval fleet is an act of war. So I don't think anyone thought the U.S. was going to go to war with their three battleships. So uh, it is significant, though. The U.S. does use this to justify some conflicts that are we're going to be talking about. This idea of, of the Western Hemisphere is ours to protect and take care of. And that leads us right into the War of 1898. So the War of 1898 is a war with Spain. Spanish-American War, we call it. So it all starts in Cuba. In 1895, Cubans began a guerrilla war against Spain. Spain controlled Cuba. It was a Spanish colony. So they began a war against Spain uh, to force Spain to leave the island. They want independence. They want to get rid of the Spanish. The Spanish, of course, had to hold on to the island. The Spanish, at one point, had controlled all of the Americas. And it had made them the richest empire in the world. Well, they had lost all of it. <laughs> Literally, like, everything was gone. So this was one of the very last remaining little bitty pieces of the land Spain had in the Americas, which at one point had made them super powerful, and now they were not. And they weren't, they weren't willing to let go of it. Uh, I don't know what they were making there. Probably still sugar plantations, probably. Uh, there were silver mines in, in the South Central America. I don't, don't know if Cuba had those or not. Uh, but whatever crops were there, Spain was unwilling to let it go. So Spain begins a policy of concentration camps. They start locking up all the citizens, putting them in these concentration camps that challenge Spanish authority. Ultimately, hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, ultimately, in the concentration camps, half a million people end up in the camps or more. And over the next couple of years, over 200,000 Cubans die in, in concentration camps. Executed, starved, 
disease, malnutrition, dehydration. It was brutal. It was bad. Uh, just outright murder from the Spanish authorities. Spain was willing literally to do anything to hold on to the camp, to hold on to Cuba, um, hold on to it. Well, the U.S. gets word of this. Again, Cuba's just 90 miles from Florida. Uh, I've been down to Key West, Florida. You can look through a little telescope thing and you can see Cuba. I mean, it's right there. I um, feel like you can throw a rock to it. Not quite. Uh, but it's just 90 miles away. Uh, so this, the newspapers get word of this. Newspapers start writing about it. They start calling it a tragedy. They start calling about how we have to go protect our, our little Cuban neighbors. And it is talked about in sort of racial tones that we have to go in and swoop in and protect the Cubans uh, who are weak and defenseless against the, the might of the evil Spanish Navy and the Spanish Empire. And, you know, it's we play it up really well. The media does. And it really starts to leave many people this nationalistic fervor. Many people get excited by it. Many people get get enraged by it. You know, how could you do such a terrible thing? Um, eh. Um... So William Randolph Hearst is one of these publishers uh, who, who writes all of this, makes all these sensational newspaper stories. Um, uh, big surge of nationalism and this idea that it's going to manufacture manhood because man, manhood was thought to be being lost because so many men weren't farmers anymore. They're working in factories or sitting in offices. So men are becoming weak. Uh, this is going to make men strong again. They're going to go out and fight and they're going to have a war. And you know, we hadn't had a war in now what? 40, 30, 40 years, most moderate, most living adults hadn't gone through any real major conflict. And so we're going to prove that we are badass again uh, by giving us this purpose of doing this. Public opinion um, was uh, in favor of intervention. Public opinion was in favor of intervening, getting involved. McKinley's the president at this point. Uh, McKinley takes a, takes a stand on the issue. McKinley tells Spain they have to take action. Tell Spain they have to stop what they're doing, warning that we're going to intervene. Pretty much citing what Olney said: that uh, you're in our you're in our wor world now, and you're in our half of the world, and we're going to take action uh, and go help our Spanish brothers. Um, we did have actually have quite a few uh, Cuban people in America, Cuban Puerto Rico from Puerto Rico as well. So. Um, there were there were a small po population of people in America that were American citizens, so there was some reasoning behind this, uh, how we felt that we needed to go and save Cuba, even though we had never taken any interest whatsoever in the plight of the Cubans, which still had slavery, by the way. Cuba had slavery or had just now, around the same period of time, eliminated slavery. Uh, uh, Brazil had slavery up until this, this time point, so... We had never really taken an interest in freeing Cubans from slavery before, but now we took this interest. Um, Span uh, Spanish and Cubans on the island. Um, there was even a, a suggestion of self-rule, I think. Yeah, an idea of the Sp Spanish will technically still own the island and control sort of the foreign policy and the trade, but the Cubans will have limited independence. Uh, I think this was actually suggested from McKinley and from our government. Both sides rejected it. Spain said, no, it's our island. It's our land. U.S. needs to stay out of it. And Cubans say, no, we don't want that. We want full independence. We don't want this partial stuff. So it fails. Uh, the whole idea of some sort of a compromise, it doesn't go anywhere. So we sail some ships down there uh, in the Havana Harbor to sort of show we mean business. We didn't start a war. But we sail some ships down there to to demonstrate to both sides. Cubans, we're going to protect you, or we're going to offer assistance or aid. And to the Spanish, hey, we're going to get involved. We're going to put ships down there. We're going to start intervening if we need to. Uh, don't make us take action. Don't get us mad. Uh, Spain doesn't care. Well, the Maine is one of those ships, and the Maine explodes. In 1898, um, the Maine goes boom, and that is an actual photo of what was left of the debris, what was left of it. It explodes and kills about 260 American sailors. Um, it's bad. Uh, it's bad. I mean, hundreds of American lives lost in a second uh, when the, the main explodes and sinks. Well, again, the newspapers got a hold of this. The newspapers start writing about it. And the tagline you see in the newspaper is, remember the main and to hell with Spain. 
I remember the Maine because Spain was blamed for it. Spain was blamed for blowing up the Maine. It was a war cry in American newspapers to actually take action and go to war. There was actual no evidence that Spain did this. There was no evidence that Spain was involved with this. Uh, however, the way most Americans saw it was, were we have hostilities with Spain. I mean, we're down there to help the Cubans, right? Why would they blow it up? Um, and uh, we're down there challenging Spain, so Spain must have blown it up. Or there were maybe uh, mines just floating around in the water uh, that some mine might have just bumped into the ship and exploded. Lots of speculation. Uh, the newspapers, though, portrayed it very clearly. If you look at the newspapers, Spain blew up our ship. These papers wrote very clearly that is the only solution, that's the only answer it was possible. Spain had destroyed our ship, et cetera. Um, there was no evidence into it, actually. Well, Spain's responsible or should have protected the ship, and this really leads us into, um, this is sort of a preamble to war. We actually found out afterwards, a couple years later, they did some research, they did some investigation. We actually think the main blew up due to a design flaw. They actually put the munitions right next to the boiler. Now you think that's stupid, right? Obviously, why would you put explosives right next to the, the boiler, heat, the engine, right? Well, they put this big mat, they put this big wall between it, like this barrier, which is supposed to be heat proof or something, I guess. And it seems like there was probably a design flaw and it wasn't heat proof or it didn't block the heat sufficiently. And the heat simply seeped through and caused the munitions to explode. And so the whole ship just didn't exploded from or exploded from the center, you know, it was a design issue. Uh, at the time, no one knew that for sure. No one knew that and no one cared. Uh, as far as everybody was concerned, the Maine destroyed our ship and killed our, soul, our sailors. It was totally their fault. So we enter into war. This is what we call the War of 1898 or the Spanish-American War. Call it what you like. It's the same, same conflict. It doesn't last very long. Uh, it lasts a few months. So negotiations fail. We continue to insist for Cuban independence, and Spain continues to say, no, we're not going to do that. Um, uh, this was really just a whole ruse to start a war with Spain. As we're going to quickly find out, Cuba, we didn't, the United States government, I mean, obviously there's some Americans that really did care. Undoubtedly, there's some Americans that cared that the Cubans were being exploited and murdered and, and literally just executed in mass. I mean... Certainly, there are some Americans that cared about this, but it becomes very evident when we look back at, at all the different writings and all the different documents from 98, from, from 98 and 99 under McKinley's administration. McKinley didn't care about Cuba. McKinley and the administration didn't care about Cuba. They had much higher goals set than Cuba. Cuba was simply a stepping stone for a much greater purpose, and that is what we're going to explain here. Um, this all, Cuba was all a ruse to start a war with Spain. It was an excuse to start a war with Spain with very, uh, very specific purposes. So in April 1898, the war begins. It begins in 98. Uh, President McKinley decides he wants to attack. He wants to keep the island. Uh, he has no interest in freeing the Cubans. None. Uh, McKinley, we know this from his own writings, from his own documentation with the Secretary of State. He had no interest in giving Cuban independence. He had every interest in kicking Spain out of Cuba and taking over Cuba himself or, you know, America taking over Cuba to keep it for two reasons, for trade uh, and uh, the, the plantations that were on Cuba, uh, the plantations and the crops, and also for protection, uh, national defense. Cuba was 90 miles off our border, obviously, so it was pretty easy that if a foreign power had control of Cuba, they could easily invade the United States, they could launch an attack on us, simple. So it was about national defense and trade and wealth and money and that kind of stuff. Uh, more than 200,000 men volunteered, uh, big, big mass volunteers. Most of them never, ever fought. Uh, hundreds of thousands volunteer, um, including Teddy Roosevelt, the president. He also volunteered. And because he's an elite and the way this worked today, if you're an officer, you have to earn your rank. Back then, they often would take uh, elite people, upper class people, and they would simply give them an officer rank. You literally would be Joe Blow off the street, but you had money, and they would just day one they just slot you in, they give you a little bit of training, and now you're an off, now you're a lieutenant or a captain. Happened all the time back then, uh, with no real military training. Teddy Roosevelt was one of these, uh, and so boom, he's an officer in the military. At the time, we only had about twenty some thousand soldiers. That's it. 
Uh, I mean, this was a period of time when just pre prior to this, the French had a million soldiers. Um, so the fact that we had 28,000 soldiers, about 28,000 soldiers in America, actual trained soldiers was pretty crazy. We didn't, that was the regulars. So we had hundreds of thousands of volunteers, the regulars. Um, they lived in terrible conditions. It was, was terrible, like it was tropical. Terrible conditions, people were not used to, very little food, supplies, um, people died. Most people, as we'll talk about, most people didn't die from fighting. Um, we didn't even have transports. We never envisioned anything like this. We had no troop transports. So we had to borrow private fishing ships, private yachts, just to get our people from Florida to Cuba. The thousands we got into Cuba, it was, I mean, if, it, if people weren't dying, it would have been comical. We had no clue how to really fight a war outside our borders because we never had. Uh, we didn't know what we were doing as a country. Um, now that sort of happens in Cuba and I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and detail that in a moment. But at the same time, it also starts in the, the Pacific and Philippines and other islands. What, 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 why? Where'd that come from? It were, this whole war was to free Cubans, right? I mean, that's why we were doing it. We were to give the Cubans freedom. What? Why are we attacking the Philippines? Why are we attacking, attacking Guam and, and Puerto Rico? And uh, why are we going after Hawaii, which that isn't Spanish, but why suddenly are we going and, and capturing Hawaii and, oh, about a dozen other islands, almost all which were Spanish? Now, maybe you're getting it. Um, this this was a, a ruse to start a war to take parts of the Spanish Empire. It wasn't about freeing Cubans. Uh, had nothing to do with that. So immediately we attacked the Philippines, which is, again, it's literally the other side of the world from Cuba. <laughs> um, we go out to the Philippines. We sail a navy over there. We go up against the Spanish fleet. We wipe it out. We, wipe, we kill every ship. We just take out every ship and, and kill thousands of people. Um, However many people were on the ships, uh, we wipe out their whole their whole fleet. Uh, this happens around May. This happens around, so it starts in April. This happens in May. We took over Hawaii. We took over Guam. We took over American Samoa. Uh, and several of these were, um, uh, several of these were uh, Spanish. Um, uh, Hawaii was not. Hawaii, I think, was an independent kingdom. Um, well, we apparently didn't care. Um, and so we did that. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, we often call it annexing. That's a real polite term. That that's that's a conquer. The more appropriate term is we conquered them. Uh, we simply took them over. But we like to use the term annex. It has a very uh, uh, benevolent term to it. it. It's really not. It's it's total military aggression. We simply simply overwhelmed them militarily and took over the island. Uh, we built a base there. We built as soon as we took over Cuba, we built a base there, Guantanamo Bay. We built Pearl Harbor. As soon as we took over Puerto Rico, every place we took over, we immediately built a military base. Some of the some of the military bases were fully up and operational in less than two months. Uh, this was a major mobilization of the U.S. military and navy for the purposes of establishing national territorial defense from the Atlantic to the Pacific, both of our coasts. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. We we needed, of course, uh, Hawaii because it was halfway for Europe, halfway to uh, Asia. Pardon me, and we could not sail all the way to Asia; it was too far away. So we needed halfway point for refueling uh, supplies, etc. Moved on to Guam, Puerto Rico. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt was involved in this conflict. I mentioned it before. He was a Rough Rider. Um, the Rough Riders were a cavalry unit, and uh, they were directly involved in the conflict. One of the more pivotal pivotal uh, battles. Let's see if I have it on here. Um, this battle of San Juan Hill right here. Um, this is actually Teddy Roosevelt right here, the skinnier version of Teddy Roosevelt on a horse. Most of the soldiers were black. Most of the people who died in this battle, this battle of San Juan Hill, which was one of the pivotal battles to actually take the capital and uh, take the capital of Cuba, um, um, the Spanish capital, most of the dead were african-american soldiers teddy roosevelt gets so much credit for it uh i'm not i'm sure he did fighting and whatnot but still the real most of the real fighting and dying was done by black men 
Uh, they did most of the real fighting and dying, African-American soldiers, even though so much of the credit was given to Roosevelt about this. Um, Spanish surrendered in July. So April, May, June, three months. It was a three-month war, give or take. Their naval fleet was destroyed as they tried to escape in Cuba. The naval, the, the naval fleet of Spain tried to get away out of Cuba. Our naval fleet chased them down, just destroyed them. Again, ultimately, between between uh, Philippines and Cuba, thousands of Spanish uh, soldiers and, and sailors lost their lives. Uh, more U.S. casualties. Almost all U.S. casualties came actually from malaria and yellow fever. Um, yeah. Uh, we lost we lost some Americans to the Spanish. Most of it was from uh, disease and infection and malnutrition uh, in this tropical world that they really didn't have any experience fighting in. And the war comes to a close, pretty anticlimactic. Now the war is not officially open to get a, uh, over to get a treaty. We're going to talk about that next. But effectively, the war the fighting was effectively over. We captured about seven different islands, seven or eight different islands. Um, and uh, we had taken Cuba and the Philippines and others. Well, we have the truce agreement. Here we see where we actually captured um, the Philippines Islands right off the coast of China. That's exactly why we did it. We wanted it as a trade depot, as basically an entrepot, which is called in, like an entry point, an entry uh, trade port to China. This was about expanding our markets and expanding our economy into Asia, which, of course, was the most populous continent. Uh, and then, of course, Cuba, the Spanish fleet tried to escape. We destroyed the Spanish fleet there. There's a battle in Santiago, San Juan Hill right here. The battle had to do with um, the African-American soldiers and uh, Teddy Roosevelt, which makes him a hero, which helps get him on the presidential ticket in a couple years. Beautiful drawing, painting, really pretty. Pretty graphic, actually. Lots of dead bodies, lots of dead Americans, dead Spanish, uh, dead uh, Spanish soldiers. Yeah. So the spoils of war, an armistice. Armistice is simply a truce. Again, that's still not a treaty. Armistice is we would simply call it a ceasefire. That's what armistice is. Uh, and this armistice, which signs, which agrees to free Cuba, gives up Puerto Rico, gives up Guam. McKinley also wanted the Philippines. He wanted uh, he wanted the Philippines, of course, for a, a trade depot uh, to get into a doorway to Asia, um, a military port, build military bases on all these immediately. As I said, uh, he takes it under the pretense though that the Filipinos can't rule themselves. The Filipinos have been under the authority of Spain now for 300 years, and they argue the Filipinos don't know how to rule themselves. The Cubans couldn't do it. We know the Puerto Rico, the uh, Filipinos can't do it. None of these islands can rule themselves. They need someone who has more authority and more power, more experience to come in and actually rule. And so we we will not give up the Philippines. When we fished start far fighting in the Philippines, we told the Filipinos we would help them get independence. The same thing we told the Cubans. And we didn't do it. We we got a hold of the Philippines and then never let go. We didn't let go of the Philippines for 100 years, for almost 100 years. Uh, we said they couldn't rule themselves. A lot of debate about this. A lot of debate back here in Amer America about whether we should be doing this. Suddenly, we're conquering islands hundreds, thousands of miles away. We're going to war with European countries. Um, last couple times we went to war with Europe, didn't turn out well. Uh, I mean, we, we technically won, but they were really catastrophes. I mean. Lots of death, lots of violence in America, thousands of American lives lost. Uh, and Spain was a big empire still, still had power. So lots of debate about whether we should really be doing all this stuff, uh, going to war with other countries and taking over these islands. Um, debate over imperialism. Uh, there was a lot of anti-imperialistic ideas basically against what America was doing, but often for the wrong reasons. Um, they don't want, uh, some Americans would have said, we don't want to get involved with the Philippines because they're inferior. They're an inferior race. We don't want crossbreeding and inbreeding between the two different peoples. They're inferior. They're, they're, uh, they're not equal to us. So we don't really want American businesses and American sailors to be over there and soldiers to be over there and inv involving ourselves in the, the day-to-day -day activities of an inferior 
population. You see that a lot, a lot of this race, racist and stuff. Um, also work competition. Uh, if we start bringing Filipinos into our country or start using the Philippines or Cuba, well, then we're going to have a lot more competition for jobs. Uh, factories might relocate, which they do. Factories might relocate really cheap labor, things like that. So you don't want that because the whole purpose is to generate the American economy and generate jobs, not have jobs go to other places. So, or American money go to other places. Americans should be investing money in America, not investing money in islands across the ocean, that kind of stuff. Um, some did actually say it was, there is some positive anti-imperialism. Some actually said it's immoral. We don't have the right to do this. This is unfair. We're, we're conquering and, it, and even though we're not enslaving, we're dominating another population that wants to be free. We should let them be free. Uh, and some of you said it's illegal. Nowhere in the Constitution does it talk about any of this stuff. So some simply said, we don't have the right to do this. Well, again, it's not in the Constitution at all, anything to do with any of this. So nothing says we can or can't do it. I guess it's up to Congress and up to the president to really make this decision. In truth, most Americans, and we know this from, from lots of media and lots of newspapers and lots of uh, public opinion at the time period, most Americans were okay with this. They might have had some doubts or hesitation, but generally speaking, the government had convinced the majority of American population that uh, this would be beneficial to our country. It will improve the economy. It will expand America's influence. It will prove to the rest of the world that we're powerful, that we're not to be trifled with. Uh, and again, it really leads to the idea of American exceptionalism. We're exceptional, we're superior. We can only help these people. We can only bring the light to them. We can only bring the light to them. This is uh, this is the white man's burden, which I'm not going to get into going into that poem right now. But if you know anything about it, it is it, it's basically criticism of racism, of this racial imperialism is what it is. White men must help the the color people of color of the world uh, bring civilization to them. It's very racist stuff. Um, so uh, Spain does give us uh, uh, Philippines. They, they hand the Philippines to us. They agree to give us the Philippines. Treaty of Paris, $20 million. And they agree to free Cuba. We free Cuba. We don't actually conquer and take over Cuba. We give Cuba freedom. I think the easiest way to understand why did we conquer the Philippines and keep control of the Philippines but we gave Cuba freedom. The easiest explanation is distance. We started the war to free Cuba and Cuba is 90 miles away. If we were gonna then continue to dominate Cuba, it would show that the whole war was a sham. It was all a fraud, which it was. It would show it's all a fraud. Um, so we had to let Cuba go. It's right there, uh, 90 miles away. Well, the Philippines is the other side of the world. It's like 8,000 miles away or something. It's 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 Asia. So uh, it's so far away, no one even knew. After this war died down, uh, most people didn't even have a clue that we were still dominating and controlling the Philippines, that we still were militarily occupying the country for years. And uh, it pretty much made it one of our possessions, as we would call it, possessions. Well, almost a year after the whole treaties all signed, we start fighting a war with the Filipinos. It's not a declared war. It's not official. It's sort of McKinley's private war. Most people don't know about it. Most people know about it for years later. Call it the American-Filipino War. It lasted about three years. What did the Filipinos want? Same thing the Cubans wanted. Independence and freedom from only, now it's not Spain, it's us, it's the US. They want independence and freedom from the United States, which is now colonizing the island and taking over the island. Um, they want freedom. It was extremely brutal on both sides. Thousands of people die, thousands of Americans uh, die. Um, and ultimately, what do we do? The same exact thing the Spanish did to the Cubans. We build concentration camps, prison camps, and we kill hundreds of thousands of Filipinos. Over 200,000 Filipinos are murdered, executed, starved, dehydrated, and die of disease. It is literally exactly the same thing the Spanish did to the Cubans which was the whole reason we went to war in the first place. And then we, two years later, do the exact same thing to the Philippines. 
only this time it's American soldiers doing it, not Spanish soldiers. Uh, almost 5,000 Americans die in the war. Uh, 200,000 uh, Filipinos die, and we win. We conquer Philippines and control Philippines for most of the rest of the 20th century. McKinley was popularly reelected in uh, 1900. Very popular president for winning the war against Spain and proving to the world that we're dominant. And of course, he was the president that was there when he came out of the depression. Just like who, if you're there when the depression starts, you're to blame for it. And if you're the president when the depression ends, you get credit for it. Even though truth be told, neither of those things really happen. You know, a president doesn't start a depression and a president doesn't really end a depression. Um, a pre depressions can be affected by the government, but they're generally a natural cause of the capitalistic business cycle. They happen. Um, you can do certain things to affect it as an administration in Washington, but uh, McKinley didn't any more save us from the depression than uh, than uh, oh goodness, what was that president? Totally blank. Uh, the one who was there responsible for getting us into the war in the first place, or getting us into the depression in the first place back in um, '93. So, yeah. Uh, let's see. So McKinley's popularity spiked, and there you go. This image is very interesting. Uh, this is the American eagle spreading its wings over uh, the Pacific and the Atlantic, the Caribbean, and all of the United States, North America. Yeah, this is American racial imperialism, plain and simple. So by 1917, which is when we entered in World War I, we control pretty much the entire Pacific. We control big chunks of Central America. We have military bases almost every one of these places you see on this map. We have military bases almost everywhere. Philippines, all these islands, all the way over here. We uh, we we wanted to control the oceans on either side of America. There aren't a lot of islands in the Atlantic. We would control those too. There's only a handful. Uh, the Pacific has really got a vault. It's really volcanic. The, under, under the, the seabed of the Pacific is mostly volcanic, so that's why there's all the islands. And Atlantic is not like that, so that's why there's not many islands in the Atlantic. So next thing we'll look at here is, uh, uh, this is a blow up here of uh, Central America. We intervened in all these places. Look at this, 1890s, 1890s, 1900s, 1903, 1903, 1904, 1909, 1912, 1914, 1915, 1916. It's pretty crazy. We've got to the point that um, some people in the media started calling uh, the entire Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean area an American lake because we thought we could just do whatever we wanted. You must understand these are all sovereign countries and almost every time we were uninvited. We simply stuck our nose in believing it was all in the interest of the U.S. To hell with the interest of the countries. Uh, it didn't matter. We simply got ourselves involved, believing it was for our best interest. And of course, if it's our best interest, well, it's for them too, right? We're gonna we're gonna help them out. We're gonna help out our neighbors. Uh, Venezuela, Panama, Nicaragua, the Canal area, multiple times in Mexico, Cuba, Dominican Republic, Haiti, Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, and it just goes on and on. Yeah. Some bit of, is it hubris? Is that the right word? This idea that uh, we think so much of ourselves that we are, oh, we can do no wrong. We can only help people improve their lives all, uh, all with American superiority and American exceptionalism and to hell with, to hell with their own culture and their own indigenous populations needs. We simply, it's all self-serving. So Mexico, similar thing. Wilson becomes president in 12 and he was very critical of his predecessors, Roosevelt and Taft and McKinley. And he said he wouldn't get any more land or any more territory. He would stop all this American ex uh, expansion stuff. He would stop this imperialism uh, as pretty much the U.S. have been doing for about 20 years. Excuse me. In reality, he does the same damn thing. Once he's president, he starts doing the same things. This is all about America's economic interests. All about helping America. Uh, benefit is really what it's focused on. There's nothing wrong with making America great. There's nothing wrong with patriotism, making America wonderful. There's nothing the issue with that. 
But if you're doing it at the expense of other countries, that's a problem. We don't have a right to build ourselves up while tearing other places down, which is almost always what happens, almost every time. Margaret, I can't even think off the top of my head of an example to when we, we got involved in intervening in these other countries and things were better afterwards. Not in this time period, I can't think of any. U.S. had diplomatic relations with President Diaz in Mexico. Uh, we were friendly with Diaz in Mexico. I mean, we shared, what, a 3,000-mile border? Uh, they were our number one trade partner, was Mexico, by the early, by the 19-teens. We were trading, I don't know how many goods. We had 11 different train lines going down into Mexico. We were, again, major trade. We had factories in Mexico. We had mines in Mexico. We had oil fields in Mexico owned by American businesses and uh, investments. We were heavily invested in the Mexican economy. And for many years, Mexican economy was pretty good. It was actually moving along well. That's probably why we were investing in it. Well, uh, a problem occurs. Um, lots of money in all this railroads, mines, and oil fields, and of course, crossing the border. Well, from the late 18, like 1890s to the early 1900s, Mexico went through multiple civil wars. Uh, hell, even at one point, there were three or four different guys all claiming to be president. It was pretty ugly. Uh, lots of violence, lots of upheaval, uh, upheaval, war, killing. Um, you think death squads is something you might have heard of in modern vernacular uh, in either South America or in Africa. Well, we think they even had those in this time period. We had roving bands of warlords that were out just killing and basically enslaving people. It was, it was pretty bad. Uh, things got pretty rough down there for several years. Well, in 1913, the country pretty much devolved into chaos and anarchy, uh, multiple people claiming to be president. <sighs> Lots of military fight and fighting going on. And the U.S., Wilson and the you know, Congress decides we have to get involved. We simply have to intervene because it is hurting Americans, like American economy. It's hurting the American economy and worried about spilling over to our borders. Wilson feared our interests would be negatively impacted by all this, and he just decides we have to get involved. Even though he made it very clear in 1912 he would not get involved in other countries' deals or issues, he would not uh, involve us in other countries' problems. First year of his presidency, it's exactly what he does. Um, President Wilson orders the occupation of Veracruz, Mexico, which is down on the coast, is close to Mexico City. He orders the occupation of Veracruz in 1914. We invade Veracruz and we have now invaded a foreign country without being invited. We have committed an act of war. Uh, technically, we're at war with Mexico now. We have attacked Mexico um, uninvited. Yeah, so... Um, the the government the government which was well, there was a government it just wasn't it was problematic there was a Mexican official government that was under attack it collapses immediately uh, because we're very close to Mexico City relations worsen immediately General Pancho Villa uh, this is a picture here I know it sort of cuts off his head a little bit but that's a picture there President Diaz is Pancho Villa uh, Pancho Villa invades the U S yeah he takes his army and he invades the United States he invades New Mexico um engages with americans kills about 16 americans uh in response wilson sends an army after him general pershing general pershing leads a 10 11 000 man army to invade mexico from the north so we have a naval invasion of veracruz we now have an invasion from north into mexico we're at full-on war with mexico even though nothing has been declared there's no declared war there's no declaration of war congress has to declare war um, this is one of our first examples of a war, an undeclared war, of which America will, of course, be involved in dozens of these over the next hundred years. Uh, this is an undeclared war with Mexico, even though it is definitely a war with Mexico. Uh, we go out chasing after Pancho Villa, um, several clashes between U.S. and Mexico. It almost leads to another official war, almost leads to a declaration of war, even though it, it already is war, really. It meets all the standards. Uh, invasion of another country, military action, um, uninvited, uh, it's, it's, by all standards, it's war. Well, this whole fiasco, um, 
This whole fiasco proves that the U.S. is going to police uh, the Caribbean however it wants. The U.S. is going to get involved in the Caribbean anytime it thinks its interests are involved. And um, this is where you start seeing people calling it the American Lake. You see it in newspapers. You see it in media. You'll see it um, popular advertising. The American Lake uh, is the Caribbean, all those places in the Caribbean, where we think we can pretty much go wherever we want. Uh, and we do. We, we leave. We're out of Mexico by 1915. Uh, we're there a little over a year. We leave, and Mexico is in a big mess, uh, worse than we, than we were in there. When we invaded, at least there was still a functioning government, even though it was under attack. When we invaded, we collapsed the whole government. The whole thing fell apart. When we left, there really was no functioning government. It was, it was three different competing warlords all trying to vie for control of the, of the country. It was worse when we left than when we got there. It almost always has been. But it's just a great example of how we are going to stick our nose in wherever we think in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, all right, so this leads us uh, into World War One. That's what the rest of the chapter is about. World War One, the United States. Make sure you're clear on this in case there's any questions that come up about this. The U.S. does not get in the war for years. The first several years of the war has nothing to do with us directly. So if you see anything that references when the U.S. got in the war or U.S. in World War I, that doesn't start until 1917. So don't get confused by that. So the two great alliances which made up the two sides in World War I, the Central and Allied, these were the major countries. And again, you'll notice the United States is not there. We're not part of this right now. Uh, the Central Powers, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy. The Allied Powers, Britain, France, Russia. Uh, ultimately involves dozens of countries. It's a world war. It's Europe fighting, but since Europeans have colonies all around the globe, anywhere Spain, or, pardon me, anywhere France has a colony, it's in the war. Anywhere Russia has a colony, anywhere Germany has a colony, England has a colony. So they have colonies, like England had a colony in every single continent. Uh, so, in essence, if England's at war, England is at war everywhere in the world. Plus, by this point in time, there's thousands of ships crossing the globe, and every ship is aligned with some country. And so, anywhere these different countries meet in the world, Atlantic, Pacific, North America, South America, Africa, Asia, anywhere the countries meet, that's war. That's why we call it a world war, because they had so many interests and so many lands around the entire globe. How many lands, you might say? Percentage-wise, half of all land in the world was claimed by European country. Half of the entire world's land masses, this, this doesn't include Antarctica, but half of the entire world's land masses was claimed by some European country. So that's why it's a world war. Uh, in essence, England is on every continent. Uh, France is on every continent. Uh, and that, that doesn't even include the fact that many, many countries are involved. Dozens and dozens of countries are involved in this. How's it start? Oh, wow. What a mess. How's that go? Oh, what a tangled web we weave when we at first attempt to deceive. I, you know, something like that. Yikes. And that is a part of this, deception. A part of this is deception and secret deals, secret negotiations. Well, one of the things that really sparks this off is the Ottoman Empire's collapse in Eastern Europe. Yeah. The Ottoman Empire was the last great Muslim empire, uh, sort of a leftover of the Middle Ages. The Ottoman Empire had existed for, wow, how long? 400 plus years. Uh, it was collapsing in the early 1900s, and by the 19-teens, it had pretty much fallen apart. Well, the deal was the Ottoman Empire had claimed much of southeastern Europe. Balkans region, think of like uh, Greece and Serbia and those type of areas, uh, Bulgaria. Much of that was claimed uh, by, the, by the Ottomans. And so when the empire collapses, you have a bunch of territories and states that are now sort of free and independent. However, they've been under the authority of some other country for, wow, hundreds of years. I'm not going to say thousands, but hundreds of years. Because before the Ottomans had controlled those countries, they were under the Byzantine Empire. So much of Southeastern Europe had not really been free or independent since, oh, like ever. So they're independent, they're free. The Ottoman Empire falls apart. What happens is, remember what I just said about Europeans being everywhere? Well, the one place Europeans really weren't and didn't have their fingers in was Southeastern Europe. 
that, that the connection there, the Balkans region, uh, I think the Black Sea is there, the connections between Europe and Asia. And what do the Europeans do? They swoop in. So all the European countries swoop in looking for opportunities of trade, natural resources. Of course, there's tens of millions of population. There's, there's markets and factories. And they just see this as a massive dollar sign or franc or whatever the hell the, the money is. Um, and so European power starts swooping in. That is where it really starts to get bad. You combine this with the worldwide interest, the fact that I think that car already covered, really, the idea that the, Europe, that the Europeans are basically worldwide. Um, make sure I don't leave anything out. Europeans wanting to control their interests. Oh, the Middle East was important, too. We had started to discover how much oil was in the Middle East, and we'd started building oil fields in the Middle East. Uh, oil, but the turn of the century, oil was starting to become an important commodity, uh, basically fueling the Industrial Revolutions in, in Europe and America. And the Ottoman Empire was the Middle East, part of the Middle East. So we're also swooping in there to start to try and control the oil fields and the oil supplies. That's also a big part of it. Well, in June of 14, um, Franz Ferdinand is assassinated. Who? Well, Franz Ferdinand is, I think he's an archduke. He was an heir to the throne of Austria-Hungary. He was going to be one of the people, maybe the next king of Austria-Hungary. He's killed. So Franz Ferdinand is killed, uh, and this is what really gets the ball rolling. Why does it matter? Franz Ferdinand would have been potentially the next king of Austria-Hungary. Well, here's the deal. Why did that happen? Because Austria-Hungary was one of the countries swooping in. Austria-Hungary wanted to control one of these regions, and specifically the country of Serbia. Austria-Hungary wanted to control Serbia. Well, Serbia was afraid of being controlled by Austria-Hungary, and so Serbia had actually made a deal with Russia for Russia to help them. Russia said they would assist. Now, why did Russia do it? Because they wanted Serbia, too. So Russia didn't do this out of goodness of their heart. They were going to conquer Serbia as well, probably. So uh, Austria-Hungary wants Serbia. Serbia declines, says Serbia wants independence. Austria-Hungary invades. Austria-Hungary starts bombing Belgrade. I think Belgrade is what it is. I'll quote me on that, but I think, it's, I think it's Belgrade. Anyway, they start bombing Serbia. And a nationalist group known as the Black Hand, and the Black Hand are the ones that want to protect Serbia for independence. They are the ones who kill Franz Ferdinand. Why did they do this? They want to make a statement. If you're going to try and take over our country, we're going to kill your king or the next person to be king. Um, and that's why they do it. Well, Austria-Hungary responds and, and attacks Serbia and bombs Serbia because they, they blame Serbia for the killing. Well, here's the deal. Since Serbia had an alliance with Russia, Russia, therefore, has to come to Serbia's aid. And Russia then is sort of forced to declare war on Austria-Hungary because Austria-Hungary is, is killing or fighting their ally. Well, when Russia declares war on Austria-Hungary, Austria-Hungary has an alliance with Germany. So Germany has to jump in. And Germany jumps in because it also wants con control of lands. And so now we have Serbia and Russia and Austria-Hungary and Germany at war. Uh, that's problematic. It gets worse. Since Germany and Austria-Hungary have declared war on Russia now, Russia had allied itself years earlier with England and France. Why? Because they were worried about Germany and Austria-Hungary's military aggression because they had been building up militarily since the 1890s. So they worried about Germany's military aggression. So Russia wanted to protect itself and it made an alliance with England and France. So when Germany and Austria-Hungary declare war on Russia, England and France are now required to declare war on Germany, Austria, Hungary. I mean, you get it, right? I mean, you should be laughing at this point, except it's not funny, but it's true. In a matter of six months, like a dozen countries have declared war on each other. Boom, World War One. It's, it's ridiculous, um, and it's exactly what happened. Uh, these worldwide alliances, treaties, pacts leads to worldwide warfare in a number of months. It's ridiculous and it's exactly what happens um, now wars are being fought all over asia middle east and africa because europeans are now have uh, territories all around the world and so a war which starts in southeastern europe spreads globally because the europeans have worldwide interests around the entire globe uh, and what makes this war even worse is new technologies that's why this is so destructive uh, ultimately um how many people die in this 20 20-some million, 20-25 million die in this, a war. 
brutal destructive. Uh, new technologies is one of the reasons so many people died. It's thought that maybe half of all the people in World War I that died, died from machine guns, new automatic guns, automatic weapons. Long, uh, long rifles that can shoot and kill people, sniper rifles from a mile away. Uh, many people died, never even knew anything was happening. They just suddenly were dead. Um, machine guns, barbed wire, trenches, mustard gas, poison gas. I don't quote me with mustard gas, with poison gas. And of course, long range artillery, which can kill dozens of people with a click of a button from miles away. Artillery shells, which fly up, fly miles up in the sky, and then come down. All you hear is the whistling. And then it's all over. Um, yeah, pretty crazy. Uh, violence, death, destruction, uh, murder. The Western Front was this place that was built up, that it was bordered between uh, France and Germany. And France and Germany fought over the Western Front for years. This entire line of trenches, all the soldiers would hide down in trenches, what it was. They would hide down so they couldn't be shot at. Um, uh, these trenches, they fought, they would run up, they'd, they'd try to run to the other side, they'd shoot and try to fight and kill each other, they'd go back in the trenches. The trenches hardly moved a few miles, and they fought for years over the same pieces of land, which I think it really might have actually technically been Belgium, because Belgium was between France and Germany. So that territory there, France, Belgium, and uh, Germany, uh, lots of death, destruction, and murder. Um, uh, poison gas, that was interesting. Because the guys would hide down in the trenches where they couldn't be shot at. I mean, artillery could still get them, but artillery was called indirect fire, which means you would simply fire it in that area. You didn't know where it was going to hit. You simply fire, and then it would just hit somewhere over there. Uh, it might kill people, might not. You generally were firing blind in this time period. But poison gas was specifically designed to get them in the trenches. They'd shoot it out in the middle of a battlefield, and the gas would just explode in the battlefield, harmless. But then the wind would take it, and the gas was designed to be heavier than air. So the wind would travel, it would get to the trenches, and it would sink down in the trenches and kill everybody. The ingenuity of humans to kill other humans is unrivaled in the natural world. Of course, there's nothing natural about this, is there? Well, the U.S. wanted to stay out of it. The U.S. wanted to be neutral from the beginning. Wilson wanted to be neutral. Uh, he wanted to keep us out of the war. Most people wanted to stay out of it. We call this isolationist. Most Americans seem to lean towards isolationist, and Wilson leaned towards isolationist. We had already made the statement very clear. The Western Hemisphere was ours. Europeans stay out, and by the same token, whatever's going on over in Europe, we don't care. You guys can shoot and kill each other all day long. It's not our problem. It's sometimes referred to as an old world problem. That's the old world, that's their issues, or you don't care. That's not our concern. Uh, so we generally seem to want to remain neutral for most of this uh, conflict. We remain neutral for a big part of it. However, it should be made clear, we were profiteering off of the war the entire time. We did in World War I, World War II, done other conflicts. We still do it today. We profiteered while remaining neutral. Mm, I'm not sure that's, I guess maybe. Um, we sold weapons, we sold supplies, we loaned money, we um, gave food to uh, participants in the war. Generally speaking, most of our resources we gave or sold to Europe, and we made a lot of money off of this. Uh, private and government uh, interests made lots of money off of this. Most of what we did, we gave to France and England. So even though we were neutral, the fact that we were giving comfort and aid is how we would use it in modern terminology, which, by the way, giving comfort and aid to another an enemy is considered treason. That's an executable offense. So we were giving comfort and aid to England and France, which means as far as the standards of war go, we had chosen sides. We were, we were part of the allies, even though we hadn't declared anything. The fact that we were giving and selling so much supplies and giving loans to England and France, I mean, it was, we had chosen sides. Um, so, uh, even though we'd like to pretend we didn't, and we were making money off of it too. Our interests were directly connected to the allies. Therefore, we wanted the allies to win. However, we didn't want to get involved. The Germans forced us actually. 
um, the Germans made us get involved. And they do this through uses of the Untersee boat, the Untersee boat, the undersea boat, the U boat, or the early submarine. This is actually a picture one here, beached. Um, the Unter Sea Boat, which made it special, first of all, it was the first underwater ship. They could use this ship underwater and they could attack and destroy other ships and you couldn't even see them. But the Unter Sea Boat was also different than modern subs. Modern subs don't operate above water. Modern subs are underwater only. These could actually do both. These could operate on top of the water. They had a, they had a deck where they could operate as a ship and then they could submerge and then of course hide and go underwater as well. Uh, they leaked all the time. They leaked like, leaked like a sieve. Um, they were very dangerous. They couldn't go deep at all. Uh, anyway, the Untersea boat, the U-boats, started sinking all kinds of ships. From 1915 on, they sunk ships. They sunk the Lusitania in 1915. Uh, if you've ever heard of the Titanic or had like an idea what the Titanic looked like, it was like a sister ship of the Titanic. Um, uh, there's a picture of it down there at the bottom. That's a picture of Lusitania. Uh, big um, uh, transport, what you want to call it? It's like a cruise ship, right? It was a uh, civilian vessel, it wasn't military. The Germans sunk it. Um, sunk the ship, killed I don't know how many people. I do know how many Americans died though. About 200 Americans died on this passenger ship. 200 Americans died on it, on this cruise ship passenger ship. Should not have, should not have happened. Uh, definitely some calls for us to getting involved. Some public opinion starts to shift after Lusitania. The US still doesn't change its stand or stance. However, public opinion does start to shift. Hey, if you're going to start killing Americans, maybe we have to get involved. Some people start talking about it. The Germans claim Lusitania was a military ship. It was covering military supplies to the English. Uh, that whole profiteering we were talking about just a minute ago? It was, actually. Lusitania actually had military weapons and supplies in the hull, uh, in the bottom cargo area. Under the rules of warfare, if it has military weapons and supplies, it can be classified as a, a ship of war. But technically, under the rules of war, because Lusitania, I think, was a British ship. And since Germany was at war with England, what Germany did by sinking Lusitania was not a war crime, even though many innocent people died. Now, I'm not a professional on this topic, but... From what I've read about it, I think it was a was a legitimate sinking. They legitimately had the right to sink the ship. Military supplies were hidden on board. How the Germans knew, I don't know. Maybe they didn't know and they just did it anyway. Uh, and also, I think it was a British ship, I think. So they had the right to do that. Either way, public opinion is really against this. Lots of people are upset and mad. Wilson actually goes over to Europe. Wilson tries to negotiate for a peace treaty. He's got some type of idealized, uh, he's got this idealized picture of him saving the world. We know this from his own writings. He really, he saw this this way. He thought he could somehow bring the different parties to the table and they would all work out their differences. And the U.S. as a third, as a, what we call a uh, neutral third party, would be able to come in and, and bring peace. Wilson tried, failed. Failed miserably. Um, they they wouldn't even talk. Uh, it was it was ridiculous. It, ha it had no luck. Uh, his negotiations don't work. Uh, neither side's interested. The negotiations fail completely. He then comes back to the U.S. and um, and uh, he then comes back to the U.S. and he he um, oh correct myself though too. I'm not going to say for sure that Wilson actually went to Europe. Uh, but he comes back to the American public and says uh, negotiations have failed the germans and the english who are generally the two main main pro main antagonists here uh are unwilling to talk and negotiate over this we're going to prepare ourselves in case we have to get involved he asked congress to start building up he asked congress for money and for the first time in our history we have a billion dollar bill signed specifically for national defense Congress approves of a billion dollars to start building up national defense and preparing ourselves in case of a German invasion. This is how it's played. This is how it's portrayed to Congress. We want to prepare to defend ourselves in case the Germans invade us. That was how it was played. Um, and we end up spending ultimately billions of dollars on national defense and building up our military before we ever actually get in the war. Well, than we do.
Unrestricted submarine warfare begins in late 1915 and 1916, and it forces our hand. So unrestricted warfare um, happens. This really creates a break in German-U.S. relations. We were, we were still trying to negotiate with Germany separately. Total separate negotiation with Germany. And it should also be noted, before this started, we were not officially allies with Germany, but we were actually friendly with Germany. We had, we had negotiations with Germany. We had trade deals with Germany. We were on talking negotiation terms with Germany. They weren't our enemy. Uh, that is also why, even though our war profiteering primarily went to England and France, when the war began, we were selling food to Germany, too. And war profiteering, we were selling food to both sides. By 1516, we had chosen a side unofficially. Almost all of our support was going to England and France. We decided they were the ones who should win. We decided Germany was the ones that were wrong in this, and Germany was really being aggression when it shouldn't, and Germany should just stop. Wilson had some real ideas that Germany should just stop, just end it. And be like, hey, we're done. We're going to stop. And if they stop, pay off some bills or whatever, pay some fines, it might all end relatively peacefully. Yeah. Well, they keep sinking our ships. Ultimately, they sink hundreds of ships. They kill thousands of Americans. Um, it's ugly. Then we intercept a telegram between uh, Germany, the Zimmerman telegram it becomes known as, between Germany and uh, Mexico. What Germany had suggested to Mexico is they were doing a separate negotiation with Mexico, trying to convince Mexico to attack us. Uh, in essence, for two reasons behind it, or two causes of it. One, uh, we had taken, if you're unaware, I'm sure you should know, everything from Texas to California was Mexico. All of it, like seven, eight states, was all Mexico. We took it all from them in, in the 1840s, 1850. So we had taken a third of their country from them, uh, totally unprovoked. They, It was total un, un, unprovocated. We just took it from them uh, without any reason. But it became the southwestern United States. So the Zimmerman telegram said, hey, look what, you, look what they did to you. Look what they did back then. And then look what they did two years ago. Two years ago, what did they do? They invaded your country. They tried. They 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 destabilized your whole country. Uh, hell, it was an act of war. Um, in essence, look at all the bad things the U.S. has done to you. You need to go into war with me to attack them, and we'll help you. Mexico wisely, because Mexico had gone to war with us, they would have been heavily outmatched. They would have been decimated by the U.S. military. They wouldn't have stood a chance. Uh, Mexico wisely declines and doesn't want any part of it. Well, we get a hold of the telegram somehow, uh, and it gets published in the newspapers. And so everyone now gets that, okay, now they're trying to get Mexico to go and incite war with Mexico. And anyway, it, it becomes a big mess. And uh, American opinion shifts again, and many people believe that the Germans are really overstepped themselves now, and the Germans are wrong. Um if the war was going to enter the Western Hemisphere, our part of the world, the U.S. was going to have to get involved. With the Germans sinking more and more American ships and this whole Zimmerman stuff and uh, opinion does shift. It gets so bad that by 1917, we're losing three ships a day. Three ships every single day are being lost to uh, German, uh, German aggression, U-boats typically. Wilson asked for a war declaration and he says we will make the world safe for democracy. This is about making the world safe for democracy, not just the Western Hemisphere. Congress agrees, and we declare war in April of 17. So the war has already gone on three years before we get involved. Make sure you understand that. This shows American soldiers on the battlefield. Uh, good thought here, sort of discussion question. What do you think American soldiers thought about this when we joined the war? Do they really... You think they wanted to? Do you really think it was, uh, and I'm going to go into some detail on this, but I still don't really talk about what people think, what people's really minds are. What do you think Americans thought about this idea of going to the other side of the world and fighting a war against Germans? And bear in mind, pretty much half of the entire American population is German ancestry. Uh, and there are probably thousands of Germans, people in America here that don't even speak English, that are that are new immigrants. So we were closely tied to Germany. Uh, Germany was heavily Protestant. I mean, we had a lot of ties to Germany, and now we're, we're basically going to war with them. Um, interesting to think about. 
Uh, here we have them on a battlefield. What do you think they're doing here? Uh, you see smoke in front. You see him with his arm up in the air. He might have been throwing something. The rubble over the ground, by the way, it's not rocks. That rubble on the ground, that is actually, um, that rubble you see there on the ground is actually um, uh, what was left of a building. And then, of course, notice what's at their feet. If you see that, there's a dead body at their feet with that smooth hat that he's got on. Probably a German soldier that they just killed. They might have come upon him dead. I don't know. Your book might even tell you more specifically. But lots of things. look at the trees. Look how the trees are too. Think about the trees. The trees are still standing, but they're they're stripped clean. What causes that? What do you think causes that to happen? Something to think about. So. 1917, we had about 200,000 soldiers before the war began. We began a draft in May of 17. Uh, within a few months, we had tens of millions of people register and volunteer. There was no need for a draft, really. Tens of millions, most of these men, and they're primarily men, never actually fought. So we had tens of millions volunteer um, for the war. We were... We were wanting to go. Americans, again, this is manufacturing manhood. This has proven the, the strength and the power and the dominance of the United States. Uh, we didn't actually arrive in Europe until May of the next year. A year. So the years go, the war goes on for three years before we get involved. Then after we get involved, it's a full another year before we put any boots on the ground. So four years, really, into this war before we actually get involved, really. Uh, before Americans arrived. Up to that point in time, all of the Allied fighting had primarily been done by the French and the English. The French and the British had done most of the fighting. This is the reason that it was so influential that we got involved. It is very possible Germany would have won this conflict if the U.S. had not gotten involved. Because Russia backs out. In 1917, Russia undergoes a revolution. We call the Bolshevik Revolution. This ushers in communism into Russia. Uh, so for about four years, Russia is under a civil war or in a civil war. Violent, murderous, lots of people die. And because Russia is dealing with all their own problems, they beg Germany for a treaty to get out of the war. And Germany complies, gives them a treaty and lets Russia back out of the war. Now, in return, Russia gave their entire Western Front. I mean, the Western, the Western, not to be confused. The Western Front I talked about earlier was the Western Front between France and Germany. But Russia gives their entire Western part of their country thousands and, oh God, millions of square miles. They give it all to Germany. They, they in essence, cut off the entire European chunk of their country and give it to Germany and say, here, you can have it. In return, let us back out of the war. And it happens. They sign the Treaty of Bret Litovsk, and Russia leaves the war to deal with their own problems, their own internal conflicts. Germany helped orchestrate this, by the way. The one who does this is, uh, is this Lenin? This is Lenin. The one who does this is Lenin. Lenin was in prison in Germany. Uh, Germans actually let him out of prison and smuggle him back by secret into Russia. And then Lenin is the one that begins this revolution and brings Russia out of the war. The whole purpose of Germany doing that, letting him out of prison and putting him back in Russia, was to see if he could have an effect like this, and he does. He does exactly what the Germans wanted him to do. He makes Russia pull out of the war. Uh, pretty crazy. So, this gets pretty bad, lasts about four years, and it creates a brand new country known as the USSR, Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. The USSR then survives for, what, the next uh, 75 years or so? Well, that was a big mess. However, the U.S. was already on the way and getting ready to attack. The U.S. lands in May. Uh, by September, the Germans are already retreating. The U.S. is, is advancing. The U.S. is invading Germany. The, the Germans are on the retreat. Uh, the U.S. is flooding millions of soldiers into Europe. They're fresh. They're ready. They're, they're well-trained, newly trained, uh, and they haven't been spent years being bombed by the Germans. So it happens actually pretty quick. By September, we get this massive push with General Pershing, the same Pershing who invaded Mexico. Uh, he pushes through France, pushes into Germany. They cut off the supply lines. They start cutting out the trains. They start taking cities and towns. 
Um, Germany was losing more and more every day, and we now have three to four million Americans in Europe. Most of them still not fighting. This, from the moment the U.S. decided to put a military force in Europe, and we decided that back in 17, even though we don't do it till 18. From the moment we decided to put a military force on the ground in Europe, the war was over. It was already over. Most people didn't know it, but it was done. It was just a matter of getting the Germans to surrender. Uh, but the war was effectively over when 15 million American men volunteered to go fight the Germans. Uh, it was, that was done. It was a done deal. It was just a matter of getting it all ironed out and actually getting Germany to surrender. Germany surrenders November 11th, 1918. We declare the armistice, which is a uh, uh, the peace treaty. This is what we celebrate in America's Veterans Day, uh, November 11th, 1918. Um, the armistice is signed, not the official treaty, but the armistice, which ends the fighting effectively. Who fought? Well, ultimately we ended up with about 4 million Americans uh, in uniform, but 10% of those African-Americans even though 10, 15 million volunteered. Uh, the armed forces are segregated, discriminated. Um, we do have women. There's a handful of women, uh, not a large number of women, but there were thousands of women as well, nurses, things like that. Uh, not really in uniform exactly. We didn't really have female soldiers yet. How many did we lose? We lost about 53,000 soldiers dying in action. KIA, killed in action about 53,000, but we lost about 63,000 soldiers to disease. So we lost more soldiers to disease than to war, to actual fighting. But again, that's because we came in right at the tail end of the conflict and really made Germany surrender. Germany might have surrendered anyway, possibly. However, when the Russians pulled out, that might have given Germany a new lease on life, if you will. And they might have won this conflict, possibly. Death toll, uh, I think I said 20, 25 million earlier. I was wrong. I was definitely wrong about that. I apologize. It was about 8 million. But 8 million died as a direct result of the war. But 8 million deaths. However, let's go back to that 25 number. And let's double that to about 50 million. 50 million died of the influenza. They died of what's known as the Spanish flu in 1918, 1919. The worst flu in the history of the world. Um, uh, killed, well, it was so bad, there were certain countries that lost one seventh of their population. One seventh of their population. Uh, one out of every seven people, that's 15% or something like that. Well, let's just take that. And look at how that would relate to, say, America. If America was hit like that in today's time period, that would be 50 million dead people just in the U.S. Back then, in 1918, it was 50 million dead worldwide, the whole world. Um, the Spanish flu, the worst flu to ever hit the world uh, in modern, at least in recorded history. Uh, it was bad. It was bad. And the war made it much worse. Because people were traveling all around the world, it was global travel due to the war, and also airplanes are a brand new thing. We now have some people traveling by plane, um, well, mostly ship and train. So the globalization of, of transportation actually means that the virus influenza is spread much quicker. So the globalization of the world is the reason so many people died, 50 million people died. And when you consider the infection rate being so high, that means Probably most people in the world got the flu and the 50 million of those that died and everyone else got it, recovered from it, and then probably had immunity to it because that's it. That's, we don't have really a Spanish flu that doesn't hit again. There's multiple waves, there's like three waves, but it's all within the same year to 18 months. Once that is over, it's pretty much worked its way through the whole world. Just about everybody's been infected or touched by it. That's it. It's over. The Spanish flu is not really an issue anymore. Uh, most people have developed immunities to it. But 50 million people had to die to get there. That's not something we want to happen, ever. Uh, it was far, far too many deaths uh, to give this kind of immunity to the world. All right. Over there, if I didn't explain that, that's what we called it. When our soldiers went over there, they went over there. There's your uh, front. There's your western front. You can see it. The line of trench warfare is the black line. 
that's the black line where the trenches are, where in essence the Germans and the French shot and killed each other for years and didn't really do anything. They fought and died by the millions over the same little piece of land, nobody ever gaining any real ground until the US shows up. We showed up with our fresh troops, we invade, we push the Germans back. We don't even get into Germany really. As soon as we get into Germany and start to invade the actual German lands, Germany surrenders immediately. Almost immediately, German gives up. As soon as they realize that their front has been broken and the American troops and others, Americans, French, Australians, Indians, other peoples, as soon as they break through the front lines, the Germans quickly realize that there's nothing, literally nothing, between the Allied forces and Berlin. There's nothing there. The Germans had put all of their forces into the Western Front and the Eastern Front with the Soviets. So in actually interior Germany, there was almost no soldiers. So once they broke through the offensive lines or the defensive lines and they start invading into Germany, there's nothing to keep them from taking every single city in Germany. So Germany surrenders immediately. It's almost an immediate surrender. Uh, they, there was nothing they could do at that point. There was no reason in resisting. So what about back at home? What was it like back here at home on, on the home front, to continue that thought, back on the home front? Um, World War I chills democracy in America. We basically shut democracy down. Uh, pretty crazy, actually. Let me move this down here so you can see some more. Save I, say, day, daylight savings time. I'll get to that in a moment. So the government attempts to enforce 100% loyalty and compliance of the citizens. You must be 100% American. It even says it right there. Are you 100% American? Prove it by government bonds. So mobilizing. First of all, we did massive war profiteering in Europe. It was pretty crazy. We sold grain, weapons, food, uh, uh, supplies, ammunition. Uh, we sold everything to Europe, and initially we sold to both sides. We lean more towards one. Towards uh, by the time we get into the war, we're primarily helping England and France. But in the, in the beginning, we sold stuff to Germany too. We did, and I say we. I'm not just saying the government did, but also private businesses. Pardon me, but if you look at it that way, what could we do? If you're a private business, that's what private business is. You could sold whoever you want to. So if you're a private business in capitalistic economy and the Germans offer the best price, you would sell to the Germans. We're neutral, right? We're not we're not taking sides. So I don't know that you can really fault countries for, for or, or excuse me, companies for deciding to sold to the Germans initially. They did. Um, the U.S. loaned all kinds of money to European nations, including the Germans as well. So the U.S. government as well was involved in this. Uh, the War Industries Board was created in 1917. It was established in 17 to direct military production uh, for the war effort. Factories were forced to convert over or shut down. Uh, in other words, you make shoes, now you got to make boots. Uh, you make uh, some type of tool, now you got to make weapons, for instance. So you have to take your production, whatever it was, your civilian production, and you have to turn it into military production. And you have to do it or be shut down. It's simply required. That's not very democratic. It is not. Forced compliance. Ultimately, most do comply because, well, they're one, they're, they're told they have to or they get fined or shut down. But number two, the government often gives loans to help them industrially realign their factories. So, oh, and they get, they get to keep the factory afterwards, even building entirely new factories. And you get to keep the factory afterwards. So most companies, once they realize it's actually profitable, they start doing it. And many com many companies comply. They comply completely and they build whatever the government asks them to build. Further, it's guaranteed payout. Uh, you have a co you have a contract. You know, if you build you make shoes, you got to wait until people buy your shoes, right? Otherwise, they sit on the shelf until someone buys them. The government gives a contract says we want a million pairs of boots or ten million pairs of boots. Make them, we'll take them. Done deal. Sign the check. Check right here. It's done. We're, it's, you know, make the boots and you got your money. So uh, most companies realized it was very profitable. That once they understood what was involved here and how much money they could make, uh, industrial alignment, even though it's not really fair, it's not necessarily capitalistic, it's not really democratic, it does happen. Um, 
the fuel administration is created. Uh, it institutes daylight savings time. There's absolutely no reason for us to still have this. Some states have actually outlawed it. Like I live in Indiana. Uh, at one point, Indiana doesn't have daylight savings time, except right up by Chicago. Like the part of Indiana right outside of Chicago still does because Chicago does. Uh, and it's really, even though it's Indiana, it's really part of Chicago, really like a Chicago suburb. But the whole rest of the state doesn't do it. Uh, no daylight savings time. Uh, most states still do this, of course. There's no reason for it. And it was done exactly for that reason, to save fuel. Uh, because fuel was used to uh, power the plants, to run the lights, to power lights with gas or electricity. The way you say fuel is you adjust the workday so it more closely aligns with daylight hours. The nine to five workday or whatever more closely aligns with daylight hours. So you shift the workday to, to make sure more people are working during the daytime so there is less fuel being used, running, um, running lights and electricity and stuff. It's weirdly ironic in a way, because as soon as we get up to full war production by 1918, almost all factories are running 24-7. So this idea of daylight savings time is we create it and then we almost um, make it moot because there's no purpose for it. Most factories and businesses are running 24-7. Uh, movie theaters, 24-7. Um, everything's 24-7. Uh, so they're not movie theaters exactly. They're... I don't know. I guess they're movie theaters by this point in time, I suppose. Very interesting. We also get the food administration. We have a saying, and I was in the military, and we have a saying in the military, soldiers march on their stomach. So, yeah, food will win the war. This really wasn't about soldiers. Uh, it was about the millions of people starving in Europe. Um, it was. Uh, we The food will win the war by feeding Europeans, feeding the allies, keeping them going, keeping the soldiers going, the ones that we had choose to side with. And it also wins the war because it's going to make us a shit ton of money, and we do. We make hundreds of millions of dollars off of selling food to European European groups, European uh, countries and whatnot. Uh, we doubled our farm acreage in the U.S., and we tripled our exports to Europe. Triple exports, double farm acreage uh, to feed, literally feed millions of people. Uh, it was a big part of war profiteering. And we were feeding the soldiers, too. French and British soldiers we were feeding as well. So it was... And you know, we were helping the Allies. We were helping our allies. Wilson believed it was necessary to suppress dissent uh, through propaganda, government action, and police action if necessary. We see laws, government action, police action. We see people arrested uh, if necessary. Uh, yeah, not democratic. Uh, many people's freedom of press, freedom of religion, freedom of speech were all curtailed during this time period. By 1917, you didn't really have those things anymore in America. Unless you were pro-war, you didn't really have freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom to express your beliefs. And even freedom of religion was an issue, too, as I'll get to in a minute. Um, uh, CPI is created, Committee on Public Information. It was a propaganda agency. In essence, it was a propaganda advertising agency for the government to educate people about democracy, to educate people about what we're fighting for, and also to assimilate immigrants quickly. In other words, if you come to America, you have to immediately become 100% American. You have to prove your loyalty to our country immediately. So, yeah, the idea that uh, immigrants, because where were immigrants coming from? Well, even in this time period, most of our immigrants come, as they always have, from Europe. So many people were fleeing war in Europe coming to America, including Germans, lots of Germans. And so many people are concerned. Hey, can we trust the Germans? Can we trust Italians? Can we trust uh, Austrian people? Or are they trustworthy? Uh, yeah, so we want to make sure we get them quickly assimilated into America, quickly into American society, and of course, getting them to do their part working in the factories. And if not, we're going to spy on them a little bit, as I'll talk about here in a moment. The campaign of the U.S. government was very clear. They didn't pull any punches on this one. 100% American campaign exactly what it's called. You must be 100% American. You must show your loyalty. You must uh, stand up for the war. You must be willing to volunteer any way needed. You must be willing to sacrifice and, and give up things. All that matters is the war and winning the war. And if you are not 100% on our side, you are 100% against us. There is no middle ground. This is a purely black and white issue. You're either for or against us. No other option. Um, yeah, this is not about freedom or independence or equality or 
freedom of thought. Um, yeah, this was pretty crazy stuff. Uh, had this not returned to normal after the war, well, you know, as normal as it was in the U.S., we would, I mean, this is like elements of like totalitarian fascism kind of stuff. It really is. And the irony there is it was all to preserve democracy. So we suspend democracy in order to fight a war to preserve democracy. Sounds really weird, doesn't it? Sounds um very, uh, uh, I don't know, ironic, hypocritical, uh, but it's exactly what happened. We targeted Germans. Germans were uh, the enemy over in Europe, but we targeted Germans here too. Germans had to, uh, they couldn't speak their language in America. They weren't allowed to go to German speaking schools. They, you couldn't listen to German music. You couldn't, uh, German religious faiths, uh, like, uh, like Presbyterian were under suspect. Um, they encouraged them to not go to church and not meet or to meet in private or meet in small groups because large groups of Germans meeting in like German Orthodox or German reformed churches would have been suspicious. What are they talking about in there? Are they planning an attack? I mean, it's crazy. Um, paranoia and fear really took over many Americans. You couldn't drink German beer, listen to German music, German food. Yeah. Uh, we then actually do create an internal spy organization. This has nothing to do with like, you know, CIA or anything or the FBI. This is a special organization specifically created to spy on each other. Uh, and the rest of that word there is spies. Uh, American Protective League Neighborhood Spies. We are to spy on each other, watch each other at work, watch each other, watch your coworkers, watch each other at school, and spy on your neighbors to see if they're 100% American. See if they're doing anything suspicious and report it to the authorities. We actually trained them. The US government uh, took thousands of people in neighborhoods across the entire country and trained them how to spy on their neighbors and coworkers. Yeah, we were freaking paranoid. Uh, as a country, let me tell you. This is part of that uh, part of that CPI uh, advertisements, 100% American campaign. Remember your first thrill of American liberty. So, another good discussion question. You're an immigrant. You see this. You're fresh to America. I'm not saying you're necessarily on the boat, as here we have immigrants actually on the boat looking at Statue of Liberty headed to Ellis Island. But you're an immigrant new to America and you see this type of imagery and you live in America, you know what's going on. What are you supposed to think? What are you supposed to do? What action are you supposed to take? And how are you supposed to feel about your country while you're doing all this? And specifically, how is this image supposed to be pulling on your heartstrings or pulling on your mind, making you think or act differently? What, what, are, they, what, what are they using here? Like, what is the elements of this that is supposed to make you be 100% American, support America 100%, and be willing to sacrifice and give up in many ways, many, many parts of the Bill of Rights, your freedom of speech, freedom of press, even freedom of religion. Why would you give up all those things? And what do they want you to buy here? They want you to buy a bond, right? A bond is where you actually give the government money. Uh, Americans were a big part of financing the war by giving money to the government which you would get back. You always get your money back with a little bit of interest. So remember your first thrill of American liberty and how is that supposed to make you think and how is that supposed to make you want to support the America during World War I? I know I threw a lot of questions in there, but you get the general gist of what I'm asking. So uh, I'm generally asking all those different things I just said and wrap it all together and think about what all of this means, uh, what all of this means with this picture, with this particular photo and everything going on. And you know, if it, if it is a discussion question, just just come up with some with some thoughts and ideas from the immigrant perspective. How would the immigrant see this, and what would they be thinking, and how how do they react to it, and all of that having to do with this this idea of 100% Americans and this type of prop this propaganda. This is purely propaganda. Well, another thing which happens, which is significant in this time period, is women's rights, women voting rights. Um, during this period, women take a stand for suffrage and they succeed. They succeed. They are, uh, they are, they, they do well. Uh, Carrie Chapman Catt, her right there, Carrie Chapman Catt. She was uh, the founder and she ran this National American Women's Suffrage Association, NASA. 
And then you have uh, Alice Paul, who led the National Women's Party in WP. Both of them supported women's right to vote. Two different tactics, though. NASA supported Woodrow Wilson. They wanted to be BFFs of Wilson. Anything Wilson needed, and I don't mean personally, but anything Wilson asked the country for, they said women should support Wilson, uh, do, all the, do all the work, step up, do the jobs while the men are away. In every way, patriotism and allegiance and loyalty to America and Woodrow Wilson will be rewarded with writing right to vote. Uh, Alice Paul saw the other around. Alice Paul was an agitator. She believed one of the, in essence, she believed that it was very confrontational. Women should have the right to vote. You need to do it now. It was more aggressive, confrontational, uh, protests, marches, speeches, public speeches, rallies, all to convince people that American women should have the right to vote. Uh, some of it led to, led to arrest and violence. I'm not aware of any women dying in the U.S., uh, any women dying. Women did die. There were women, for instance, when something like this went on England, women stormed like Parliament or the Buckingham Palace or something. And the guards actually, there was women that were killed, women that were killed in the streets out in front of uh, in, in London. Uh, so in London, in England, women died trying to get the right to vote. I'm not aware of it happening in the U.S., of any women dying, although there were definitely arrests. So in 1918, Wildrow Wilson sub announces support for a constitutional amendment. He calls it a war measure. Uh, it's going to reward women for everything they did during the war. Millions of men went off and fought, left the home, went and trained. Again, 15 million men altogether uh, ended up being enlisted or volunteering for the war. Women had to step up and fill those positions. They had to step up and do the jobs and work in the factories and, and uh, sacrifice. And he says they're going to be rewarded. All of their actions, in essence, how they held down the home front while the boys were over there, to use some words from our lecture here, uh, women need to be rewarded. It took two years to get this through Congress. Uh, two years of debate, discussion. It was, was passed in 1919, finally. That's why you should never forget this the rest of your life. 19th Amendment passed in 1919. Women's right to vote. It, I don't know why you'd ever forget that. It's really easy to remember. Uh, it was a two-year debate among America, among the states, because if a constitutional amendment comes up, the states have to ratify it. I think like two-thirds of the states, three-fourths of the states, one of those. Uh, a supermajority of the states have to ratify it. It takes a long time. It takes well over a year for those states to ratify it, and they do finally ratify it, and it becomes an amendment in 1920. So it's a two-year ordeal, and it finally does happen. And it's really simple, it's one sentence. That's it, right there. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. It simply says women can vote. Uh, one simple sentence. Uh, yeah, you don't get much law that's that way. You don't get much legal uh, legalese that is uh, one simple sentence. That's all it was. Uh, it says women have the right to vote. So we were not the first country to do this. We weren't. Uh, there was a couple other countries that did this, but we were one of the first. We were one of the first handful of countries on the globe. And you know how many countries there are, right? Right? You know how many, right? Uh, today, there's about 220 countries in the world, ish, uh, ish. Uh, I don't know how many were there back then. Probably comparable. Probably 200 plus countries. And so we were one of the very first. Um, and immediately, uh, pretty much all the rest of Europe followed suit. By 21, 22, 23, just about every European country had given women the right to vote. So that's great. This is a great way that we sort of led the way in this. Changes as a result of the war. Huge changes. Huge changes. Uh, massive changes to the war. Uh, massive changes to the country. Uh, women get the franchise, as it's called sometimes, the franchise. That's the right to vote. Women get the franchise. Increases opportunities for women's, blacks, Latinos. Um, as again, as the white people went away, the white men went away, minorities came in and filled in a lot of the jobs. So opportunities, jobs, work. Um, many of them came to the cities. We see large influx of urban populations. Many people come into the cities to find better paying jobs, get off the farms, especially black sharecroppers. Sharecropping, which was a common form of, of farming for black people in the South, is just a step above slavery. It's terrible. Sharecropping is practically slavery uh, without chains. 
anyway, uh, many of them left and came to the cities looking for jobs and factories. Urban growth, increase in, in employment, increase in massive boost to the economy. Um, this really significantly pushes America forward. Uh, it makes us, the end of World War I makes us one of the leading, well, probably the leading, probably the leading economic and industrial powerhouse in the world in 1920 is probably the United States, greater than any other country. Russia was close. Russia was close. But they had lost a lot in the war. They lost a lot of land, a lot of cities. They had lost millions of soldiers um, between the war and the civil wars. The whole revolution, they lost a lot. So economic, employment, manufacturing boost. Remember all those factories that were subsidized by the government? Those go back to the employers, back to the private companies, and they get to continue trucking along, making all their goods, retool their factories, and the government paid for all of it. Sure, it makes many, many more people rich and wealthy. Uh, so how about women here? This is an interesting image. It really is. This is another one of those discussion, discussion questions. What is unique about this photo? In the time period, given all the stuff we've talked about women and race and the war, what is unique about this group of women at the Puget Sound Navy Yard in 1919? What are they doing? Again, Puget Sound Navy Yard, look in the back. Look at who's in the back watching them, too. Look at all the people up there on the ship. Those are all men. So the women here, different colors, white, black, working at the shipyard right alongside men. The war, racial issues, gender issues. This is a relatively very, this picture, for instance, and in what should really make you think about it, would never have existed before World War I. Never would have had this photo. So what is it that makes this photo possible? Not going to give you a lot of hints. Just, just think about all the stuff we've talked about and think about why this picture is different, unique. What is special about it? What makes it unusual? How's it come about? Uh, and then tell me about the women. Think about the women. What are they thinking? Several of them are smiling, happy. Um, is everything all rosy? Everything all perfect? Um, everything's great, right? Think about it. Uh, what are they doing? What's their job? What's their purpose? What are they thinking? Lots of questions there, but just generally, uh, the question is simply to discuss. Discuss what this picture means. Discuss all of the meanings behind this photograph and the emotions of the women and what they're thinking as associated with it. Because this is unusual for this time period and would not only have occurred this particular photograph would only have occurred because of the war so the war ends Woodrow Wilson wants to be the the deal maker he wants to be the one really negotiating he wants as he, he tried all through the war to be a negotiator he wants to be the savior he wants peace among equals is what he calls it he wants all parties to get together and have an equal and fair negotiation and uh, everybody to come away from the table satisfied, naive, idealistic, foolish, not sure which, maybe all. Um, not an idea England or France wanted. England and France didn't blame this. England and France took massive losses, uh, millions dead, cities destroyed, massive debt, uh, it destructed their entire way of life, their economies. England and France had no interest in peace among equals. They had no interest in shaking hands and going back to your own corner and, hey, you know, all things good. Yeah, it's all good. No, 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 no. Uh, they were imperialistic. They were powerful. They had money and they wanted they wanted their pound of flesh uh, from the Germans. Let me tell you. Uh, he creates something called a 14 point plan, which is uh, calls for freedom, arms reduction calls for self-determination for the uh, losers, the central powers. Self-determination meaning the war is over, we're going to shake hands, and you can go about your own way and sort of determine your own future without us making the rules for you. I mean, you, you started the war, but we're going to forgive you for it almost. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, naive, foolish, idealistic, all the above. He also creates, he wants to create a new uh, national, uh, international governmental body to prevent this from happening again. 
In other words, a place where different countries can come negotiate and compromise and, and deal, work out their problems so they don't have to go to war and kill millions of people. This becomes a League of Nations, uh, the precursor to our modern United Nations. It is um, weak. It has no power to enforce any rules. It has no power to make any countries do anything. Excuse me. Uh, it was hopeful it would foster peace among the world's powers through peaceful negotiations instead of warfare. And it does not. Uh, the victors, the victors versus the world. The victors were England and France. They were the big winners. Now, we won the war at the end. But we made it clear. Wilson made it clear we didn't really want anything from it. We came in to bring peace to the world and democracy. Wilson made it very clear we didn't actually want. Typically, when you when you win a, a war or a conflict, there's a term we use. It's called the spoils of war. Whoever wins gets the spoils. They get all of the, the, the treasure. They get the booty. They get the, the, the wealth. They get, they get to stay, take stuff from the losers. You get all the spoils of war. America didn't want any part of it. England and France, though, did. England and France wanted everything they could get a hold of because they thought they suffered heavily in the war. They thought it was an unfair, unjust war. They didn't believe it should have ever had to go into war with Germany. Uh, they were really, really pissed about Russia. Russia is really what brought them into the war. Uh, really, their alliance with Russia, and then Russia bails. Uh, they were mad. Oh, my God. The, the authority and the governments with England and France were livid about this. They, they thought everything about this war was wrong. All the death, the war itself, their, their, how they got sort of swindled into it. Uh, they were pissed. And they wanted to take it out on somebody. And that somebody was Germany. Um, they slapped Germany with $33 billion in reparations, meaning you have to pay us back in goods, supplies, trade, money, whatever, $33 billion. Uh, that was more than the entire GDP of Germany. They, there was no way Germany was ever going to pay that back. Um, they had to give up all kinds of stuff. They, they had to give up ships. They had to give up their military. They had to give up factories, oil fields, mines. They actually gave up almost a third of their country in land. They just, England and France just carved out entire chunks of their country and said, you don't need that anymore. We're going to take that from you. Those are where all the oil fields are. We're going to take that. You got a bunch of mines. We're going to take that. Yeah. And of course, they were prohibited uh, from uh, ever building military goods or supplies again. They could never build for war again. The Treaty of Versailles. Uh, this is how it's pronounced, Versailles. This Treaty of Versailles, which officially ended the war, was terrible. It was terribly atrocious. It, um, well, put it this way. Many historians will say one of the causes, maybe the most significant cause, maybe. Well, depression is probably number one, but number two, cause of World War II is the Treaty of Versailles. The treaty so badly hurt Germany, it could never recover from the war. And it so angered Germans that they were so uh, insulted by it, it so damaged their economy, it damaged their entire psyche of Germany, as Germany were the enemy, Germany were the villains, Germany were evil. Germany's, Germans didn't see themselves that way. Germans thought they were simply responding to a, a, a crisis in Europe. Germans simply wanted uh, some power and they wanted some territory. Germany's, Germany came to the assistance of Austria-Hungary, their neighbors, their friends. The Germans didn't really ever feel that they were the bad guys in this. You might say, well, bad guys always think that, right? They're not the bad guys. Uh, it so created such resentment in Germany, that hatred in Germany, that it, it allows someone like Hitler to be created. It allows people like Hitler to be created. And which, of course, is really what ends up with World War II. Uh, this really helped foster and create the next war. It really did. There are also nine new countries. Boom! We have nine new Eastern European countries carved out of parts of Germany. Austria-Hungary, which is now broken up into two different countries. Austria and Hungary are now separated. So we get nine new countries carved out of Germany, Austria-Hungary, parts of Russia, and of course, the Southeastern Europe, what had been the Ottoman Empire. Nine new countries. By the way, did any of those countries decide their borders? No. 
Who decided their borders? England and France did. England and France did all this. England and France wrote, in essence, they redrew the borders of the entire of Europe, which has got like 30 countries in it. They just redrew all the borders. Regardless of what anyone else wanted. Here's something to note. Here's some countries you never mentioned. Uh, China was our ally in this war. India was our ally. Japan was our ally. All these other countries were allies. What did they get out of the Treaty of Versailles? Technically, they were the winners. They were on the, the winning side. They assisted us. China and Japan and India and Australia all helped us in this war. What did they get out of it? Nothing. Nothing at all. That comes to bite us in the ass in 20 years. Japan. Yeah. The last thing we'll talk about, the end of the chapter here, is the mandates which occur after the war ends. Remember that whole thing we dealt with with uh, the Philippines and Cuba? They can't govern themselves, right? They've been under the authority of Europeans for so long, they don't even know how to self-rule. Well, much of the Ottoman Empire now that it's gone, uh, many of those countries and territories are left open up for grabs. Southeastern Europe, those nine countries are created. Several of those countries left open for grabs. And the belief is by many Europeans, especially English and French, that we have to take care of them. We have to protect them because they can't rule themselves. They haven't ruled themselves forever, so we're going to go in and take care of them. This is a ploy. This is a deception. It's a ruse. It's specifically to get control of the country's economies and the natural resources, especially the Middle East. Oil, Northern Africa, uh, gold mines, Central Africa, diamond mines. Uh, Asia, oil supplies, population, all other types of natural resources, anything you could imagine. Yeah, these are really colonial possessions. They call them mandates. A mandate is where you're required to do something. It's a, it's a requirement that you have to take a certain action as this mandate. Well, uh, with the way the Europeans framed this was that we have to take care of our these other countries. Because if we don't, no one else is going to take care of them, so we have to step in. Instead of giving them freedom, we, in essence, make colonies out of them without calling them colonies, because that's now gone out of fashion. It's not, it's not fashionable uh, to have colonies anymore. That is, or, that is a past era to where Europeans colonized and exploited uh, other countries around the world. They're still doing exactly the same thing. They just put another name to it to make it more acceptable for modern vernacular uh, with sort of putting the onus on we're helping them. But the reality is they're still being treated as colonies, literally exploiting, sucking out the resources and forcing them to buy the manufactured goods from these European countries. It's the same damn thing. It's no, really no different. We have a British mandate in Palestine. Most of these areas are taken by England and France. What is also another real significant thing is a British mandate in Palestine. Palestine is what eventually becomes Israel. So we have these thousands of Jews moving there for land. England creates this and specifically tells the Jewish people that you now have a place to go. Israel hasn't been created yet, but they, they start carving out this land out of Palestine and, and relocating Jews there from England. Oh, and then America starts doing it too. Uh, eventually thousands, tens of thousands of Jews relocate from England and America to Palestine, to these territories in Palestine, which England has now carved out because England now controls this part of the, of the Middle East. And it's all all English mandate. And so they start carving out big chunks of this territory in Palestine and moving the Palestinians out and the Jews in by force at gunpoint. These Palestinians have lived in the same areas for, oh, how long? 15 centuries? 1,500 years? Uh, I mean, if someone came in and said, oh, you've been here for 1,500 years, it's time to get out. We're going to take it all from you. I mean, think what we did in America with the Native Americans. It's very similar. We came in and took all their land and territory from them where they lived for thousands of years. Uh, we did that. It wasn't right. It was wrong. What we did to the Indians was wrong in every way. There's really no, there's no, uh, there's no justifying what, uh, what the United States did to Native Americans. It is reprehensible. It is. It's a tragedy uh, that will forever stain the American soul. Uh, what we do to slaves, what we did to blacks and Africans. Is the same thing. It, you, we will never ever get past that in the history of our country. We can't. I mean, it was just, they were crimes against humanity. 
what we did to Indians, what we did to slaves, what we did to blacks. Um, it really was. Well, we start, and we are part of this. We're actually helping. We do actually help England in the control of Palestine. We give some supplies, some money, some resources, some military goods. Uh, and we also relocate thousands of Jewish people uh, to the Palestinian area. Now, the Jewish people go willingly because they want the land. The Palestinian people do not give up the land willingly. Uh, the issues that really begin here in 1920-ish in Palestine, 100 years later, we are still dealing with today. Now, it is far more complicated than this. I'm giving a very simple uh, overview of it. But the conflict started then, and it really hasn't stopped 100 years later. Uh, it is still one of the one of the most conflicted parts of the world, Palestinian-Israeli relations, and it is not looking like it's going to change any time soon. Uh, and it really begins here after World War I. Uh, now, we do this in some ways as an actual sort of a, a war measure uh, to, to pay back, because many, many Jewish people actually helped fund the war. Large amounts of money. Jewish people were in banking in many parts of the world, and so they were heavily influential in supporting the politics and supporting the war effort monetarily. This was a reward. And since England already had control of the Middle East as a mandate, it was a simple, easy thing for them to say, all right, we'll just start clearing land and moving people out and give you some land that you've been wanting forever. You've been wanting to go back to Jerusalem and Palestine forever, so we'll start helping you out. It may sound a little innocent on the surface, and of course it leads to massive conflict. Long-standing consequences of this are actions at, in the Middle East. Uh, worldwide disastrous consequences of the treaty. Uh, Asia, India, South America, Africa, the Middle East. Uh, this war ended in 1919, yet the effects of it, you could argue in some ways, have still not ended today, 100 years later. This gives you your new countries, all these new new countries which are carved out and created in Eastern Yugoslavia, Hungary, Australia, Czechoslovakia, Poland, uh, East Prussia, Lithuania, Lithuania, Estonia, Finland. I know I said it fast. I said it on purpose. Uh, say all those three times fast. Do it now really quick. I'll wait. Okay. Um, so, yeah, these new nations, new reconstituted, these demilitarized zones. Of course, that whole Western Front is demilitarized. Uh, France takes it over, in essence. France starts controlling that. British mandates right here. There's Palestine. That's a British mandate, as we just discussed. French mandates. Um, it doesn't really show here on the map. But like if you look at a big map of Africa, almost the entire continent of Africa is controlled by France. All of northern Africa is France. Uh, French controls most of the Italians. I didn't mention that either. Italy actually switched sides halfway through the war. Uh, halfway through the war, Italy realized they were on the losing side with Germany and Austria-Hungary. And they ask for access and admittance to the Allies, and we accept them. So at the beginning of the war, Italy was allied with Germany and Austria-Hungary, and at the end of the war, we they were allies with us. By the way, they got nothing out of it either. That's another again, Italy, World War II. Uh, Italy got nothing out of World War One by assisting us for the last two years of the war and choosing our side. Uh, they got screwed as well. The only countries that really benefited at this war was over, that really benefited economically, were England and France. Uh, it makes them world powers again. Uh, they had been in many ways overshadowed by the United States in the last 50 years. And this allowed them to really gain more international power around the globe. It really did. Well, that ends our chapter. We're done. It took longer than I expected, but that's okay. Still shorter than class. Still shorter than a three-hour class lecture. Anyway, that's where we end right there. And thanks for watching through all of it. And we'll see you next time.